I was thinking a little bit about the idea of um, a formal equation and the thing that caught that brought it into being. So oftentimes we're we're given in school a formal equation that we're told to memorize and use when we have certain problems we encounter in symbolic mathematical you know language. And the point of math is to just, you know, you always want to make this side equal this side and make it balance. And you got to, you know, there's certain tools to, to solve a problem. Now that that's useful, but it, it gets really bad. It gets kind of, I, I, I guess I would call it ideological when you stop thinking about what were the powers of creative thought that, that occurred, which made this equation, which at one point did not exist as something to use, right? It wasn't a discovery, whether it's the Pythagorean theorem or whether it's the inverse square law, whatever. It didn't exist. Uh, somebody had a great discovery, found a way to communicate it by wrapping it in a symbolic language to communicate to other minds that could then use it. But if you don't reproduce the, the quality of the, the, the original mind, that original Eureka, it becomes just an ideology. I believe it's true. Why is it true? It's true because it works. That's totally circular logic. That's not sufficient reason, right? That's not like, if, if you care about the truth, that, that shouldn't satisfy you, which is why a lot of students don't do well in math class. Um, the ones that do do well usually are not using their mind. They're just using their memory. So I think it's like that with, you know, in, in the Bible, there's, there's points where there's the warning that, you know, one should not lose, lose the spirit in favor of just the word. So it's when you start using, well, why is it true? Because G Jesus said, well, that's not exactly sufficient. That's somewhat circular too. It's true. The fact that Jesus said it says something about Jesus's wisdom that, you know, mercy turning in the other cheek is, is better than, than vengeance. Okay. But think it through a little bit more. So it's not an ideology anymore, right? You're, you're, you're owning it and it's a spirit. So the spirit of the, the creative force that brought the, the rule into being is what is animating you and not the rule itself as something that replaces your own power of thought. And I think you'll find that in Islam, in Buddhism, you'll find it everywhere. This, this tendency to want to take things that came out of a creative process, turn them into formal crystallized things, and just basically have it think for us, right? Have the rule think for us, which then causes us to hate creativity. So whenever somebody then comes up with a new idea that is creative, we, fe we feel challenged by it or threatened by it, which should not be what we feel. We should feel like, wow, great. You know, a student is asking a professor a difficult question that the professor doesn't have the answer to. Wonderful should be the answer, not sit down, get out or something, whatever, eh? like whatever hostility <laughs> creative people encounter. It, what you're you're introducing is critical theory for those who might not be that aware. Um, although it's becoming, I think people are are waking up to this this reality. This is something that that originated as a theory um, in the 1930s and 40s by something called the Frankfurt School of philosophers, who were basically a misanthropic misanthropic grouping of philosophers who had been had seen some crazy shit in World War One. They saw humanity doing some pretty terrible stuff, and they essentially concluded that this is that World War One, the horrors of what was leading up to World War Two, were caused by human beings being connected to their traditions, that the traditions of the past, the belief in nationalism, uh, uh, religious uh, adherence, family units, all of these things that connect us as individuals to the past um, caused world wars to happen caused all of the abuses and, and negative things. And so their cure that they came up with as social psychologists was to come up with a way that would, a, a system of theories that unfortunately today is very active and dominant among, in the Western education system and, and culture more generally, to um, encourage ways to break society free, especially the young generations born after World War II who were subjected to increasing doses of this this uh, system um, that basically would break them free of being infected with the thinking of white dead European males. Because the idea was if you're all, all theories that are dominant today are dominant because people who were, who had superiority colonial complexes imposed their views of the way the world works onto the weaker people, whether it's race or females or whatever, the, the, the under the non-dominant groups. 
And that's what became in a sort of Darwinian survival of the fittest fashion. That's what became the dominant systems of thought in the world of the 20th century. Now it's true that there are bad theories that were input onto us by dominant white European males, right? There, there were bad white European males, just like there were bad everybody. There were bad women and bad black people in you know, Africa who enslaved various other of their own brethren, right? You could find cases of good and black everything, but their conclusion was it's specifically Dante, Shakespeare, Mozart, all of these, they're all as equally bad as Hitler's views or any, you know, uh, <laughs> and so we have to find ways of bringing in theories that are thus relevant, that don't allow people to judge right and wrong because it's the act of judging right and wrong that causes war because obviously Hitler made judgments of what was right or wrong. And we saw the consequences of his judgments, which was war and mass death. So it's the judging that they're saying is bad. The inner standard of thinking that you have a better and a worse that you can, you can you know, standardize or use as a standard to, to decide what is gonna happen. That all had to go. And so the relevant, like more modernist theories that they promulgated, people like Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, uh, Eric Fromm, uh, Kurt Lewin, are names who play a prominent role in this, this matrix of thinking. They, they basically said, okay, we, we need people who reflect the ugliness of the world because the world is ugly and people have, as to the degree that they believe that the United States was founded on goodness or that there's good things in their white dead European male uh, writers that they like, to the degree that they think that there's actual nobility there, they're, they're sick and we have to heal them. So to be healed, you have to be able to accept the ugliness of the world that is. And so that became why you had things like Lord of the Flies that was that became taught as part of the high school curricula to young, young malleable people um, whose ideas were underdeveloped. And they were now being introduced to cynical views of human nature embedded in these stories that were promulgated, like what we saw in Lord of the Flies or Halden Caulfield and uh, Catcher in the Rye or, you know, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World or Fahrenheit 451. But but all of these things were then put in, right? Whether you're in Europe or whether you're in Canada or the US, you're now reading these things as a grade nine, grade 10, grade eight even kid. Um, <clears throat> and when you're going to university, it's even worse. Now you're ripe, having gone through that, to read things like Sartre or Camus or you know other cynical people who just really despise humanity or Nietzsche. They just, just they don't like humanity, but that's what they're, and, and you're feeding off of this stuff or re going into the arts programs or music programs that we talked about last, our last show. You're, you're now being told, you're conditioned to now accept the ugliness, which is, which you have to respect in modern art, abstract art, which is just as good, you're told, as Rembrandt or, or Da Vinci. Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko are just as good as Da Vinci and Rembrandt. There's no qualitative difference. You can't judge one is better than the other or else you're a fascist. And so this stuff, it, it really messed people up. It took on many forms as far as I've, I've been able to tell, but amongst uh, for anybody who wants to get a sense of, of it, as it actually played out, need, need only read um, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World Revisited 10 years later, where Aldous Huxley is talking about the progress that society has actually made be after his book was first published and how impressed he is that, you know, like LSD didn't even exist when I wrote this book. I was calling it Soma, but now look how wonderful this effect is. Um, and look at the, the type of conditioning of a society which is enthralled with its sensual passions that he has, you know, everyone is basically living in feelies. Your, your sensual identity is, is, is overriding your thinking um, all the time to stay to, so that you love your, your inner uh, concentration camp without tears, as he calls it. You love it. You, you could be, they could open the door and you could be allowed to be free, but you're like, no, I'd rather stay in there because that's where my drugs and my sex is. So they, they wanted to figure out a way to bring that into being. And, and I think when you look at some of the people who followed his uh, theories, who set up things like the Esalen Institute, or who also set up things like Tavistock, like Kurt Lewin, who was also a Frankfurt School a follower who set up a group dynamics. Um, and, and how do you get people to fall in line instead of thinking that they personally have a knowledge of a truth? That is what is an authoritarian personality that has to be shunned 
and shamed out of existence by the group dynamic pressure that a teacher, otherwise called a facilitator, not a teacher anymore, is directing the students of the group to put pressure and, and, and intimidate the, the, the creative student, the one that stands out, because they're right. now a disruptor. There, 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 it's been a long, a long known observed fact that it, it's more effective to control people by their will than by force. So a lot of these um, hypocritical liberal fascists, like fa people who actually are fascists, but they want to project the image of like loving liberalism. These are like the people who are the founders of the, you know, today's rule based liberal international order that tries to virtue signal uh, Russia and China and other uncivilized authoritarian nations for being bad, where it's like, who was doing the regime changing? Who's been the one doing the assassinations and all of this stuff for the past, you know, 80 years? Election um, and manipulation. Yeah, exactly. Like, who's, who's doing that? <laughs> um, and, and so I think that when you have that sort of language, like we all agree that we all agree upon like, first of all, you didn't get any agreement, really, but you're trying to pressure people to all give their acquiescence, thinking that now they'll be more easy to self-control to the degree that they have just given you that acquiescence. But it's like, no, that's not actually how you... If it's true, you should be able to bring somebody to a discovery of something being true without just saying, like, let's just... We all agree that it's true because everyone who's smart thinks it's true, right? It's That's that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, I think when you um, when you look at the origins of, of feminism, you know, it, it, it arose. It, it's been a long standing thing, right? This this yearning to have right. equal rights, equal access to opportunities for right. men and women for genders. That's that's that goes back a long ways. Right. Um, it's is it unfair that that uh, it, it's played out as it has? Sure, it's unfair, and, and things. Are, there's been a fight for emancipation of people, of races, and of of gender. Um, but going back in the 1940s and 50s, Frederick Douglass, the the slave who, um, you know, he he fought for his freedom. He escaped, and he became he rose to become a, a leading thought leader in the 19 1850s, and he became even Lincoln's advisor at a certain point in during the Civil War. Um, he worked with with uh, suffragette organizations that were working to also free the blacks. And it was part of a, a, an idea that we're human beings first, that we all have to fight for a higher human justice and help each other in that common fight. And, you know, Frederick Douglass was helping the suffragettes. The suffragettes were helping um, the, the plight of the, the black slaves. And it, it had a very strong, I mean, there's some really powerful, strong stories. And then it was really only in the, you can see it really turning inside out in the 1960s with the with the bra burning movement and, you know, uh, like things started getting weird and it became, no, I'm a woman first and a human being, not even second. I don't even think of that. It's just your your attribute as a human. So you're a white human, a black human, a female human, whatever you are. Um, it's the, the secondary attribute that became the defining character and being a human stopped mattering. And all of a sudden you just started seeing otherness everywhere, right? Man is not woman. Uh, blacks are not white. And uh, more of an illustration, artistic sort of background that I'm coming from. I saw that same thing when I was taking a couple of years of fine arts after illustration. And uh, there's this encouragement to just express yourself at the big from the beginning just express yourself in ways that might be kind of interesting um but it but there's no building on the foundations of past great um benchmarks of artistic history so you're not relearning you're not learning from the masters who made these wonderful penetrating breakthroughs into in in chiaroscuro in uh in um all sorts of properties of expressing nature you don't learn any of that they just talk about it a little bit in art history then you just jump onto like splattering paint or whatever 
and uh, it's it, it it cherishes and rewards mediocrity. It, it, it affected everything. Nothing nothing is untouched by this. Whether you're you'll you'll see this huh. for those who've been through science, um, or th arts or sports, it's it's infected every part of our lives. Media. Before you can really begin to do anything serious about it, you have to first diagnose it within yourself because we're all in various degrees born into this already sick system that had these permeations. And so like it or not, on some level, conscious or unconscious, there are things that are holding back, withholding our ability to tap into our, our higher faculties, our creative reason, these other things that are, have been diminished in force. There's so many discoveries though, you know, you, you, you just, anybody looking online will find that there's amazing schools and breakthroughs in cancer research that are outside of the mainstream sort of priesthood controlling the levers of funding to what is acceptable, you know, methodology of teaching and practice in pharmaceutical, you know, what, or in medicine. Um, same thing for energy. I mean, there, there's so many breakthroughs that have already been made that we're just not even told about. And I think that politically, there's a lot of, of barriers that are being artificially jammed into the machine to keep these things from being unleashed. On the other hand, that's just what already exists. There's things that are beyond people's imagination that are already available in many ways. If you could just get that political will to change, that that's not the, I don't have an answer to that. On the other hand, there's breakthroughs that we still should have made years ago that we haven't because people have been crippled spiritually, emotionally, that they have to heal themselves from as well so that they could make those discoveries in the arts, in science and other things. And that requires doing work. You gotta, I mean, we gotta take our education into our own hands in many ways because you're not gonna get it in the institution. So having you know, programs like what you're doing, uh, what I'm trying to do with the, the Rising Tide Foundation with my wife um, and our seminars and, and astronomy work that we're doing, uh, for students. These are our ways that we have to sort of capture and create a proper curriculum that we should have had access to, but we didn't because we live in this oligarchically managed society. So there's ways like that, but we definitely have to take responsibility for ourselves. That's for sure. For our own minds. I, I think that's a good point. And I, part of the problem in, I think, part of the, the corruption in science that's been permitted to, to permeate has been caused in, in no small measure by the acceptance of becoming um, a go-nowhere consumer society back in 19, late 60s, early 70s, when the dollar was floated onto the, the floating exchange rates. And we, we became what was celebrated by some um, networks as the post-industrial society. You know, they're like we. The former, the former wisdom was that you know you had to have industrial production and growth and big projects to give you know vitality to money. No longer is that the case. Now we can just consume, have you know, export our industries to you know people in dirty lands that we don't have to look at who stay poor to but send our our things we used to make ourselves back to our dollaramas, and that will be the new the new wisdom. And I think that now it's been over 40, 50 years even of that type of stagnation where because we don't do anything, we don't test our ideas. And so crappy standard model theories of the atom or uh, all sorts of just theories that might look nice on a computer screen, you know, and they're like maybe logically consistent with themselves, but they have no bearing in reality. If you try to uh, apply those theories, it doesn't work. You can't even test out string theory. There's how many, what, like 11 different, you know, models of it. You can't test one as being more right than the other. It's all just, um, so I think if you start doing things again and actually saying, okay, we have, like we used to, before I was born, I I've read books <laughs> that, <laughs> that showed me that society used to have, you know, people would have a vision of the future state that you want to do. You don't know how you're going to get there, but you're like, we're, we have to, green this desert or whatever and and then you figure it out along the way and then oh, as you're figuring it out you're testing your thoughts out and things you very quickly get to see what's crappy that doesn't work and then you get to reevaluate well what's a better theory that does the job whether it's asteroid defense whether it's a uh, terraforming another planet even in you know the next century or whatever like there's so many things to do <laughs> 
And I, I for yeah. me, what gives me right. hope is the the multipolar approach because currently you have a clash of the unipolar doctrine of you know NATO, the rules based order, all this crap that's that's atrophying, and then you have this multipolar alliance in defensive nation states with Russia, China, other nations with the Belt and Road Initiative, all building big things for you know, 30, 40, 50 year projects in the future. Um, that gives me a lot of hope because that orientation will help you filter out qu quickly shitty ideas that don't work that might you know, be popular but are still not true versus unpopular fringe ideas that do the job that you quickly discover, okay, we got to go in that direction instead. And you might discover that atheism is not actually part or compatible with real science if you do that. Thank you.